everybody. So we are so excited to be here to talk about the finale. It's the big ending for this season of Chesapeake Shores. This is Chesapeake Chats and I'm Rachel and Lisa is here. Hi. And Casey is here. Hi guys. Yay. So we did it. We uh, watched the whole entire season. And so we're going to talk a little bit in this episode about our thoughts of the finale and we'll talk a little bit about the show as, as a whole, our thoughts and uh, whether we think it will be renewed. So it should be pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> and so, yeah, Casey, what was your overall thoughts about this finale? Um, just go to my Twitter and look at the last tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go right now and see what it says. Yeah. It says, what? That's yeah. it? I think that's what? literally that's what I it. said. That is probably the summation of all of our thoughts. Lisa, did you, what did you <laughs> Oh, that's it. You said, that's it? What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then my last, my next tweet was, current feelings about Chesapeake Shores. I'm eating my feelings with pretzels and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so baffled. Like, this was not a, I'm sad, I'm crying, I'm eating chocolate. It was like, I'm baffled, like, I'm just eating, like, hmm. <laughs> mm. <Mm-mm>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's just, it was a very frustrating for me. And so I agree with you, too, <laughs> we both. And we don't have anything against the show and we don't have anything against any of the actors. In fact, we like them so much that that's part of the frustration of our frustration with the story. And, you know, we just got to be honest. I know there's a lot of people watching that agree with us and that have given us that feedback that they have been very frustrated with the show as well. So we will be your voice. And if you loved it, please share with us in the comments or on Twitter. Yeah. Just know what worked for you and why you uh, disagree with us. That's great. We'll have a discussion. So it started out the episode with <laughs> Brie being Mrs. Cynical Pants. She said, because life is one giant cosmic joke, and not the ha-ha kind, the wet sand, soggy kind. <laughs> so what did you think of Brie with this? What do you think, Casey? Brie had so much sass. I was like, who are you? What did you do to Brie O'Brien from last season? Like, she was just so, like, bitter. I don't know. I mean, like, the way she she came across, like, there were so many one-line zings, and I was like, dang, girl. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. I don't know. And she was like, well, it's just a fictional, if a fictional story about a fictional family can break our family. And I'm like, didn't you literally just say in the last episode that, oh, well, yeah, it's really not fictional. It's really about our family. Right? Right. 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 So (laughs) now all of a sudden you're like couching yourself in the defense of literature. (laughs) And like, I'm sorry, I would have a lot more sympathy for her if we had seen more than four minutes of this conflict and this meeting. Like if I felt like I understood they were all really ganging up on her or they really, we literally saw four minutes of this whole thing. And I just will, I will never understand that choice. Uh, So frustrating. We don't even know what the book says. No. Like we don't know. We have no inkling of anything with the book except for it's basically about, I don't know, Casey put her foot in the sand waiting for her mom to come back. That is the only thing that they've mentioned about that dang book from like episode two. Yeah. And there's like a mariner involved or something. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's it. That's all we know about this book. I feel so cheated. (laughs) And I just said, I said, look, Brie is independently wealthy with a large support system who are still speaking to her and trying not to mention her own business and a boyfriend so she may want to tone it down a bit. That was my thought. Like, <laughs> you know, she was acting like she had the hardest life of anybody in the whole world. And it's like, stop it. You still have family who are actively trying to understand you and who are meeting with you and talking with you 
And just because they have a different point of view of something that you're doing, it could be way worse. They literally could be suing you, like, <laughs> if they wanted to, if, if they felt like it was defamation of character or whatever. Like, they still love you. Right? I, Lisa? I'm going to take the other side for just a okay. moment here <laughs> in that I understood her irritation because she kept saying, well, this is how I remember it happening. And this is my reality. And this is my version of what happened, which I respect. And I'm like, great, you wrote a book about it. You just, and yeah, you're sharing your version of what happened, which is for her very valid. I think my frustration from the whole thing was that um, she wasn't open to, that's your interpretation. And then there's another interpretation because we didn't get to see the actual conversation about those interpretations and how they meet and how they don't meet. And so that to me was the most frustrating part. I didn't really have a problem with Brie like getting upset about because she did. She <laughs> worked her butt off and she lugged around seven scripts all over Chesapeake Shores with a thousand post-its and couldn't decide which one. I mean, that was some hard work there. And so I can see her frustration. I'm so frustrated because, so we got four minutes with them talking about the book and like a couple lines from Megan about saying how she was unwell and, but we never got an answer about why she didn't get custody. We never got an answer about why she didn't have more visitation, why she wasn't more involved. I just find it very hard to believe that, that, that Nell would not, that basically like there's two possibilities of the situation. One, uh, that Mick didn't allow her to be in part, a part of these children's life. But according to like everything we've been told, Mick was very uninvolved. So I can't imagine him being all of that opinionated on whether Megan was really involved in these kids' lives. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I can't imagine, I can't imagine Nell allowing that for one second. And if the answer is that she was unwell and she had postpartum depression, which is what, uh, which is what, uh, Barbara Niven said in her Facebook post, she talked about it, but that Facebook post said way more than anything that the show said. Way more. Like, we never even heard those words, postpartum depression. We never heard about any of her diagnosis, any of her treatment. We never even heard the words depression. We had a couple lines about her being unwell. And I, I just, I just don't understand why she was so uninvolved in her children's lives and why that was out of love. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I do not think that the show did a good job at all of explaining no. her point of view. I just felt was so frustrated that we get like four minutes of this big family meeting that we've been waiting for. And then this whole episode was just a whole bunch of apologies. And I'm like, why is she apologizing? What did she do? If she did it out of love, then why is she apologizing? Yeah, that made me the most mad. Yeah. Yeah. I was really mad. Um, so I'm reading the first book in an Eagle point. Uh -huh. So spoiler alert for everybody who hasn't read the book yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> I kind of skipped ahead. I read like the first four chapters and I was like, okay, let's get to the Megan stuff. So in the book, Megan leaves and Abby, Abby catches her leaving. Abby is 14. She catches her mom leaving and her mom says, I'm going to come back for you guys. Um, so it is a little different in the fact that there's no, I don't think there's any mention of like depression or anything. It was just like, she could not handle being married to Mick anymore and uh -huh. his, like workaholicness. So she comes back and this is where I, I skipped to the part where Abby confronts her. Um, it's not that she didn't want to be involved. It's that she, when she left, she hurt everybody and Jess watched her leave. Like Jess was like, mommy, <laughs> but I guess her, Megan never, heard it I guess she was already leaving like she'd already left like she was outside or whatever um so I can see why that would be traumatic for Jess who was maybe I think she was six in the book um so when Megan comes back uh, when they're all adults Abby confronts her and says like why'd you leave why didn't you come back and she's like no I was gonna come back for you guys I actually had a four-bedroom apartment in New York your dad paid for it um the intent was for you guys to come up but Mick was I, I guess they were already so settled in Chesapeake Shores that every time 
um, she'd try to get them or whatever, he'd be like, no, you're disrupting, a, you're disrupting their lives. Like we've already healed from you leaving and you just coming back is going to disrupt our lives. So just, why don't you wait? And it was like, kind of like a, well, like, like, let's, let's, let's wait, maybe next month, that kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like when she would visit, the kids would kind of like push her aside and like not interact with her because they were just so hurt by her leaving. Um, and then she said that she had, she kept that really big apartment in New York for years. And then that's when Abby realized like, why else would she have had that apartment? Nobody wanted to come to visit her. Like that's what it ended up being. Mm -hmm. And so then she goes back to Chesapeake Shores after all those years. She downsizes her apartment. Then she goes back to Chesapeake Shores. I don't really know why I skipped that part of the book. And then um, she wants to heal the family and bring them back together. So I think where the show misses it is they really could have honed in on the, like the depression thing and yeah. said, you know, she was really depressed. And then that's why Mick was like, no, why don't you keep taking care of yourself? And then, cause I can see that that would be a more compelling story. You know, yeah. it would give a reason that we were not like, what? She didn't want to see her kids. They don't want to like, you know, and the kids being young and not understanding all that. Yeah. Or just saying so, like, yeah, I saw you guys at Christmas or something, but like it just never could be quite the same or just something instead of just these sort of flat, I was unwell and I left out of love. Like, I want to know what that means. I want to know what that means to the character. We have not had anything beyond that. Yeah. The book had way more. And also like, it just doesn't make sense. Her relationship with Mick, like if, if I had, if somebody had, been the cause of me not spending time with my children like there would be super baggage and super anger about that like that is a horrible kind of thing to do and so like when they were talking about oh did we go on a date it was like ha 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 like no <laughs> like that would yeah. not be the mm-hmm. reaction like if if I was falling back in love with somebody who would take it, who would not let me see my children like it would be a very complex experience. Yeah. Think Lisa about this, about with Megan. Well, because when I think about it, I, I think back to the first season when they were always fighting whenever they were around each other. Uh-huh. And um, you know, whenever Mick and Megan were together alone, um, it was never very long because they would start arguing and then they'd get frustrated and just walk off and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to fight. We you know, that's why we not together and you know. And that led me to believe that things were probably really, really terrible in terms of fighting in their marriage. And I, I, for me, my take on it was always, I never really got the whole thing that she left because she was sick or depressed or anything. And of course that plays into it. But I always got the impression that he was from Chesapeake Shores. He had established himself. He had all the business there, all the financial ties. He's the one that basically had everything there. And so when it came time for somebody to leave, Megan probably was like, okay, so do I take all these kids away from their grandma and where they're from and where their entire generations of family from and all the money and all the support and stability and take them to an unknown in New York where I don't even know what I'm doing and I'm still trying to figure stuff out and leave my husband and, and, you know, or do I leave them here and go work on myself and come back? And I always thought that that was probably the hardest choice to make is saying, I got to work on myself and then I can come back. But I can only imagine, I mean, the saying is there's a thin line between love and hate. And when you love somebody and it goes wrong, you can get real evil real quick just to get revenge. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it needed to be that serious, but I mean, I could see how things could get real, real sticky real quick and the kids got involved like in the you know kind of like the the juggling ball like okay well then I'll do this to you with the kids and I'll do this to you with you know and that sort of thing and they got caught up in it and for me having the older kids that could have real easily them being irritated and bitter spread down to the younger kids so the younger kids grew up into that well mom left because all the older kids like mom left so get over it Oh, yeah. you're right, mom. Let, and that's the attitude. And so then it just swells and it gets worse and worse. And then Megan is like, I can't come back now. They're settled. They don't need me. They don't want me. Not knowing that the reason they're so angry and bitter is because they want her. 
I guess that's the, yeah. the thing about this show for me is that I feel like it's constantly setting, setting up these false dichotomies that like the characters have only two choices and, and if they, to choose from. And in this case, there, there aren't only two choices, or at least I don't feel like the script has successfully eliminated a lot of other choices. Like, why didn't she have the kids for the summer? Like, that's really common in divorced families. That wouldn't have interrupted their school. Why didn't she have the kids for Christmas? Why, like, most divorced families that I know, you end up with different kids wanting to live with different parents, going back and forth, and, then, you know, the kids using parents, like, kind of against each other a little bit, that kind of thing. There was none of that. Like, none of them were ever closer to her. None of them ever reached out to her when they were, like, fighting with Nick or anything like I don't know I just feel like there's they're like they're putting up this dichotomy that like she either had to leave out of love or she stay in this horrible marriage when it's like there's there's an in-between there that should have been discussed and I want to know why it wasn't ever understand only having four minutes Mm -hmm. of that meeting like that's like that's just insanity to me but well this is the whole reason why I got into the show I got into the show because as a mom and I saw Megan and her struggle from the very beginning, I was like, dude, this is going to be really good. I mean, the whole family drama of it all. And I was like, and especially with Abby at at the beginning of the actual show when she's struggling with her work and and kid balance. And that was me for a number of years. And I was like, okay, I identify with a lot in this and I'm super into whatever happened to make Megan leave and find out. And, that's what drew me in. And so the fact that it was um, season three, like kind of just pushed aside and treated like a, a minor storyline that, that basically come, that's where my frustration is. Yeah. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and another, so another false dichotomy that they give us is this false dichotomy that the only choice is either for trace to go on tour and for him to be a selfish, horrible human being, or for him to stay at home and they're going to be in love forever and their life's going to be perfect. And and this is, I mean, I was totally with Trace. He's coming to her and he says, hey, we can FaceTime, we can hang out, we can, you can come and visit, you can go to Europe, the girls can, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's right. You can totally do it. You can totally make it work. The idea to me that he, as somebody who's just dating her, am I the only human being on the planet who remembers that they are not engaged? Like you do not, if you are just dating somebody, you are not expected to be the primary caregiver of her children. Like this is insane. And so he's expected to just drop everything in his life for somebody that he's not even engaged to. I just don't understand that. And so like, why couldn't they sit down and they figure, okay, we are going to talk every single day at 9 p.m., whatever. We are going to, uh, and for an hour, or we are going to, like there are so many, every single, every single career that anybody does takes them away from their family. It just does. That's the way it is. Whether you are a doctor and you're working 70 hours a week in residency, and you're on call and so you're going to miss you're going to miss recitals you're going to miss stuff because they're going to call you and you have to go that doesn't mean you're a terrible person that's that's called having a job and i don't care what job if you're a police officer then you're in danger and you're going to get called you know you have to work if you are an actor you go on set you go on <laughs> like it just doesn't make sense to me i don't understand why trace is the bad guy in this situation he literally came up to her and told her this is, you know, I have all these other people that are depending on me for this tour. I've committed to them. And like, if we had had one conversation in this season about Abby being frustrated that they weren't engaged, we have not. We've not had one conversation about her wanting to get engaged or Trace not being there or Trace not being somebody for commitment or whatever. So I don't... I can't imagine that is the problem. And, you know, instead we're supposed to say that he's the bad guy because he's living out his dreams in any other movie. He would be the hero and she would be the villain. And for, for stopping him achieving his dreams, like 
what? <laughs> I just don't understand. I don't get it. And I was extremely frustrated. I, and she even says like, okay, sure, fine. And he gets all, his hopes all up. And I don't know. Do you, can you, Casey, can you defend Abby at all? Can you, <laughs> what do you think? Okay. I have two, two things. And there, one is going to be from my writing, the, not my writing, but the writing part. And then the other uh-huh. is going to be stemmed from our friend, Chris, who posted this on Twitter. He said, and this kind of made me think. So he says, um, I think there might be deeper meaning to why Abby's doing this. She might be realizing she clearly doesn't believe she and Trace are right for one another. She may believe that she's fooled herself enough, so to speak, has grown up in a way from Trabby. So... Uh-huh. Now, this is kind of a stretch because, again, the writing failed us in showing Abby's frustrations with the whole band tour thing, not being engaged, like all that stuff. So that aside, I was thinking if I were in her shoes, I had girl, I had young girls, I rekindled my relationship with my high school boyfriend. I'm picturing him as my high school boyfriend, not as 35 year old. <laughs> Yeah. mature you know yeah. and I feel like when they got together she was picturing them as like their high school selves like they're in the same place in life all that stuff as their relationship has grown she's realized they're kind of on two different paths in two different interests so Trace is still like kind of you know it, this is based on what she wants right like if she wants that life then she can have that life right um, if she doesn't want that life, that might be a thing. Like, I don't know if I would want, you know, if I wanted a serious relationship, if I wanted my boyfriend who I would hope would propose to me be traveling all the time, you know, just because I, I would like a father figure for my children 24 seven, you know? Um, and I think sometimes you see in relationships that the person you knew back then is not the person who they are today. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you're just going on two different paths and you might not be the ones for each other. So Mm -hmm. I think maybe um, Chris is, I think there's some validity to that because it does happen, you know, and even with friendships too, like, um, you know, I had a childhood friend where like peanut butter and jelly and then we were apart for several years, came back together and we were kind of like, oh, (laughs) this is kind (laughs) of awkward. (laughs) Because we're not (laughs) best friends anymore. (laughs) But I mean, it was cool because we're just, we're just, different than how we were as kids and that's fine you know so I think there's that then there's the other side so (laughs) So, uh, first of all why are we repeating the same storyline as last season yeah exactly we're ending like exactly the same exactly the same um why didn't Abby say things like I don't want you to go like why did she like let him believe that she was going to be okay with it. Um, why didn't she have these conversations while they were having their little fireside chats? Like, I, I just, like, poor Trace. He was so blindsided, and he was, by the whole breakup thing, and to break up at a gorgeous little pool with the little regatta thing, uh-huh. like the little sailboat, and he literally spent time, you know, painting the little sailboats for the girls, and he did all the little you know, snipe hunts and he has the, legit, he did so much for her and he has legit like, spent more time. Me. Yeah. He has like, legit spent more time with those girls this season than Abby has for sure. Yeah. I, and Abby is supposed to be this career woman, like this uh this really independent, strong career woman. She's the last person that I would think would want basically a stay at home dad for her girls. Like I would think that she would be pretty modern and open to different kinds of relationships, but there isn't even a discussion. It's just like you either do it my way or that's it. We're done. We're not even going to talk about any other kind of way that we could do it. I just don't understand why she says, Oh, I have to work on myself. Like what? Huh? Like why do you, wait, wait, you, I'm, I'm confused. Like there's no, there's been no inkling that she's been struggling with anything other than the whole like jealous mom, Miss Marvel thing. Like that, that's it. That's the only struggle that we've seen, like internal struggle that we've seen of Abby. 
everything else has been like, oh, everything's honky dory. Oh my goodness, we're in this museum and we have all the cheese and wine and flowers. Woohoo! Or I'm going off to be, you know, a groupie with the band or like all this stuff. And I'm like, what? Aside from Trace being a moron about the bridge, we haven't really seen any other major flaws in his character this season. Like, I, I, I don't understand, like, what are the, are these people that are painting him as this villain for, like, going on this tour, I just don't understand it. Like, he is not even engaged to this woman, and he is going to pursue his career like most people that are humans do, and he expects, he wants her to, to support her. He wants her to support him in this endeavor. Like, I, I just, I don't, I, I kept thinking about in The Princess Bride, <laughs> when Wesley says to Buttercup, he says, this is true love. Do you think this happens every day? And I'm like, yeah, that's right, Abby. Do you think this happens every day? That you can just like, nah, yeah. He even dies tell and you. says it. What's that? He even dies and says, he's like, you think death is going to stop me a little true love? And that's I'm like, not- Died through love. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm 37 and single, so maybe that's my perspective. That like, yeah, if I had to wait for the love of my life to go on tour for six months, I'm waiting. It's not a problem. <laughs> like we can make it work. Like I don't know. So I guess that's my perspective coming in. But mm-hmm. I just I was banging my head against the table watching this. I just thought it was so frustrating. And I just don't think that the script has done a good job Mm-mm. building up either of their characters to make either of the, this decision valid. And I just don't think that they have done a good job. Like I said, it's a false dichotomy. It's like you have to pick this or this when there's lots of other choices that could be made. Can I just say real quick that me watching it, my only thought was, man, this is single people for you because the married people are like, where do I, when do I go? When are we leaving? Yeah. Because they're like, oh, you mean seven months with my own bed and not being woken up by kids at like three in the morning? Yes. Seven months? (laughs) Really? Can we go for a year? Yeah. Let's do this. Because, please. I I mean, I love my husband and I love my kids. But if you told me right now I'd even have a a night in a hotel by myself, I'm like, where? Let's go. What are we doing? (laughs) Snacks? Who's bringing snacks? You mean I get to sleep for a full night? Yeah. I'm in. Let's do this. Yeah. You can have the Twilight Express or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I it would you the, the married guy on the tour is like, uh yeah. And the, the wife's in the background not saying a word. And I'm like, they get it. Cause they're like because the wife even is probably like, you mean I get the bed to myself and I get to watch TV no matter like whatever I want to watch yeah. for the next seven months. Where <laughs> we, let me pack your bags, dude. Let yeah, let me get you out the door. Yeah. I I really thought she was going to go with him. Like, I thought that's Which, where that was yeah. going. I thought what she if, was going to be like, you know what? I know we talked about this whole thing and we can make it work. But, you know, I am t- putting a whole month's worth of leave and I'm going to go to Europe and I Asia. I would have screamed if she would have said that. I'd have been like, oh, miss, I'm here to work on my relationship with my kids and spend more time with them. <laughs> No. <laughs> I say nay to that. Oh. There. So I don't understand because for me, I would want him to go even if it upset me because, okay, let's say he goes seven months, comes back, everything's great, another tour, great, go. Because I don't want to be the reason why the person I'm with has regrets. Because <laughs> let's say he doesn't go and 10 years from now, all of his bandmates are successful, it's always going to be in the back of his mind. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what happened with me. And then you start looking at that person and being like, yeah, and you leave wet socks on the floor. And here I am. I could have been on tour. Yeah, I could have been Trace Atkins leave. if it wasn't for you. And you screwed yeah. it up. Like, you know. <laughs> and you won't even put yeah. gas in the car. And you let it get to empty and I have to do it. Yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Because <laughs> that's how it gets. After yeah. about 10 years, you're like, uh, are you leaving that there? Also... Okay. These girls have three other very stable parenting influences in their life. It's not mm-hmm. like it's not like they're orphans and he's their only parental figure. Then that would be a, another discussion to have. But like, I mean, not only three; they have many. Like, they're gonna be fine. And <laughs> like, 
I, I, I don't know. I didn't get it. I didn't like it. And, and especially her, like, basically saying, oh, yeah, things fine, whatever, at the beginning. And then her, at the end, being like, I'm sorry. I can't do this. I'm going to break up with you. And I was just... In public. I mean, sister. Oh, yeah. Mm-mm. You don't need to bust out twinkly lights, but at least go somewhere with a door and <laughs> and say, that right hey. before a whole event where you know he's going to see your kids and they're going to be like, hey. and they're standing across from each other. That was so awkward. Like they're standing across from each other, and the kids are like, "Yeah, we won." And Trace is like, um, "Yeah." Uh, so that was incredibly frustrating, and I know a lot of people agreed with her. And were like, "Ooh, this is so empowering. She's being a strong woman, or whatever." And I just don't feel like the script has 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 done that. Like I can imagine oh. her dumping her boyfriend being a strong move, but I don't think the script has even close to have validated that choice for me. No, well, for all my complaining, I'm like, good. Then get out. If you don't want to live that life, then do get out. Then yeah, then good for you. Then take your kids and go find uh, Victor Webster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's some nice stuff in the episode. I liked. It was kind of funny. Nick talking like pirate. That was pretty funny. <laughs> On the boat, there's a lot of boat. That, you know, they're going out in the boat. Free and confronts Caroline. They have a little bit of a moment and uh, there's a little bit of a scene between Bree says that uh, she has a little thing about how her, his book was just full of rom-com cliches. And I'm like, you're on Hallmark channel, tread lightly. <laughs> Bree. Uh, but I actually thought this whole sort of interaction was kind of fun between Simon, Bree and Caroline. It was kind of flirty, sort of fun. Yeah, I just, I didn't understand the point of bringing Caroline in this in this close to the end. It didn't do anything. I think it was basically, she, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It, it was great to see Kimberly Susted, and I'm like, yes, I'm all for that, because she's amazing, and I love her, but <laughs> I didn't understand, because I would understand if it was like, um, Brie was still struggling whether she really liked Simon and she was struggling and then bringing in Caroline made her realize oh I do like this guy and I do want to be with him but they already established that when he swooped in with that big tall drink of water kiss yeah we get the scene with uh with David and Jess and they're taking care of the the diner and I guess that's gonna be their new job or something I don't know but Jess is still really concerned uh is David gonna leave her and maybe partly because she looks up to Abby (laughs) 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 because Abby makes nonsensical choices uh in this regard I don't know I I guess I have a really hard time relating because she's just not my personality at all like I when I uh when I graduated from high school I left home so fast. I was out of there. I literally went for summer term and I never moved back in for more than like a month. And it just, my mom had a baby when I was 18. So the last thing that I wanted to be was at home with a little baby, you know, crying and everything. And so I, I just, I really can't relate to that at all of being like, and I know that's a valid point of view. It's just not one I connect with very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With her being super worried that everyone's going to leave her, despite them all saying, we're not going to leave you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. how are they going to, well, um, yeah, that whole thing was, I thought that was a kind of weak storyline because David has shown again and again, you know, he's going to be there and he likes cooking. So settle down, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just roll yeah. with it. Yeah. Roll again, it comes it. down to, like, for me, it comes down to the deeper storyline. Like, I can understand if she, her mom left her, she witnesses her mom leaving, um, her dad's like an absent father, her sister, who's, you know, several years older, grows up and moves away. Yeah, and she looks up to those three people, then yeah, I can understand that, but they didn't do a very good job in writing a compelling enough story and giving her depth in her character and like her, you know, abandonment issues or whatever. Um, and I feel like, again, that could have been real uh, another thing where they kind of missed the boat yeah, yeah. i just feel like they went backwards on her yeah. yeah 
Well, and David is just a paragon of virtue. He's perfect. He never makes any mistakes. He never, uh, you know, he never has any moments of doubt about Jess. Never. He's just perfect. Right. And he went after her. Like, it would be one thing if she had been chasing him, chasing him, chasing him, and then it was like pulling teeth to get him back. No, he put that dang shoe back on her foot. And that was like a symbol of like, I, I left everything for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we get the pecs coming back, and like they had real potential here with the pecs <laughs> to make them a compelling villain, to make them uh, an antagonist. Maybe not a villain, but certainly make them an antagonist for the characters, and to really dig deep and make their relationship have to withstand this great mm-hmm. pushback. And we have them coming back and buying Justin in and saying sorry like sorry for I, what what did they do i need more of that i needed to know what they did like oh, really yeah. mm-hmm. what they gave her a nice dress and threw a party like what i mean they looked into her life they invaded her privacy i'm sorry here's an in on a platter Don't invade my privacy and buy me an obey <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was you can know like, all about me if you get an obey <sighs> it was such a missed opportunity they mm-hmm. were just so boring and it could have been really fun and it just went nowhere like all of that because i think we were excited with the cinderella scene because we're like "Ooh, this is gonna be really fun and this is gonna go places and then <sighs> it went nowhere so then we get we, we already talked about all the scenes. The, we get this scene between um, Jess and, I mean, between Abby and Trace. And Trace is taking care of her daughter, <laughs> as usual, building the boats. And then Megan comes in to talk to Bree. And Bree was so rude. She says, Connor called. I guess you're making the rounds. Like, What? And I just said on Twitter, I said, all I wanted was one episode where they truly dive into Megan's decision and we find out about why she didn't get any custody and what leaving out of love means to her. Instead, we get four minutes and an apology tour. And, and, and then for Brie to be super rude like this, I'm like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. She's just still bitter about the being told not to publish her book and so she's just like, whatever, but I don't know. Also, Jess says, our parents have disappointed us our entire lives. I call shenanigans on that. (laughs) Because they have literally been there for her over and over and over again over the course of the show. And maybe there's all the stuff that the character is not showing us that has been disappointing, but we can't fantasize about that. We can only Mm -hmm. go off what the show has shown us. And we have seen parents that have been there for her one time again after another. And so that is just ridiculous. I mean, I know people that would do anything to have a relationship, they have, have family that meets regularly and that, that has regular, uh, that, you know, that is there for her when her, her Danny gets termites and they're there for her. They're offering to get loans for her. They're offering to help her. Like the idea that these parents have disappointed them their entire lives is absurd. Yeah, that, oh yeah, that statement, I was kind of taken aback. Now, if she would have said that season one, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I can see that. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I guess we just have to accept the fact that this is Hallmark's version of a broken family because it really <laughs> doesn't seem that broken to me, but like they were talking about Hallmark. And so maybe that's the problem is I just, I don't know. I have kind of wondered if like, for me, like what I find appealing about a two hour movie. And in general, I like t- I like movies way better than TV in general, but I think maybe what I find appealing about a two hour story that's squeaky and clean and fun and uh, and maybe not all that realistic. Maybe when I watch it as stretched out into a television show, I find it less palatable, <laughs> a little bit harder for me. Uh, I, Cause I'm not a huge fan of What Calls the Heart and I definitely didn't like this. Uh, the only one that I've really, really enjoyed is The Good Witch. It's the only one that is funny and doesn't take itself too seriously. Uh, um, and Mayor Martha is just the best person ever. So <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe part of it is just my struggles, but 
I just, I was very, very upset with her when she said that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think it was realistic. I, I understand maybe she meant like emotionally, but even then it's like, like, we've been saying most of the season we haven't been shown a lot we've been told a lot and that's Mm -hmm. a huge reason why some of this just doesn't um connect because we just haven't seen what they're talking about like it's great that you know you guys had all these experiences when you were younger but we don't know about those maybe you wrote tons of backstory and you guys have a great deal that's you know leading your character and how you're giving us these lines but we don't know about any of that we just know what we've seen you know i agree with mick when he said it's not perfect but we're working through it and that's the best you can hope from any family Mm -hmm. Uh, because i mean i'm 40 and i feel like you know i've lived a good life so far but i still don't know what i'm doing with my kids i mean (laughs) I mean, every stage they get to, I'm like, oh, I have to learn this stage now. I mean, there's no handbook, and who knows what I'm doing. To, to, like, I'm doing the best I think I am in the mm-hmm. moment, but 10 years from now, I'd be like, Mom, do you remember when I was like 10? I'd be like, oh, Lord, what did I do? All of that could have been really compelling, and I was so excited at yeah. the beginning of the season. I really thought there was such potential to really dive into these characters and really uh, have some interesting conflict and have you know, these, and and I I just don't feel like the script was there. I, I felt like everything was either resolved really quickly, or it was, uh, or it was just kind of, or it was just not very satisfying the way it was resolved. And one or the other, like it was with Megan, or this thing with Therese, and um, where I, you know, I was just like, what? Uh, So I know the only character that I thought really had a satisfying arc and really did the best job out of the whole season. I mean, I, I did really enjoy Mick throughout the season. He, he was the one that made the most sense throughout. Basically, <laughs> he was the honest one. He was the upfront one. And so he was good. And I think Connor was good. I think that Connor actually made mistakes and he wasn't perfect. And he had to apologize and he had to move on and he had to grow. And I, I think in this last episode, you saw him with, with Megan have a little scene uh, that was, and then you saw him with his dad and have a little scene. And so their relationship actually grew and developed and, you know, they were flawed and they talked and they had like, they worked on it. And I, I just, I think that he was the one that by far, I think the conflict, even if the Danielle stuff wasn't perfect, he was my favorite out of all of them for sure. I yeah. Think- yeah. I mean, you're right. He, he had the most growth and it stayed um i thought jess was on her way because you know you know she's she's her character's pretty neurotic and pretty um clingy but Mm -hmm. you know when she went to go visit with the pecs and then she came back without david and she started doing things on her own and then when david got back and she was still doing things on her own i thought okay she's learning how to stand on her own two feet and this is going to be great and then they take the in away from her and make her back to the way she was at the beginning. And I was like, oh, I thought she was on her way to more independence, which I thought was really cool. Um, but yeah, Connor's the one, you know, and Kevin had his struggles where, you know, you don't want to be with somebody. And I thought he and Sarah's storyline ended pretty, pretty cute. But yeah, so yeah. let's talk about that for a second. So <laughs> So they go up to visit Sarah's uh, family and Connor and Connor and Kevin. And there is this football game, which I am just, I don't understand. The football game. It's two people versus one person. And they're like throwing it. And then they're like beating him up. Like this is a game. Like I feel like it was like, People who've never seen football, like trying, uh, like it what? Was dudes with a ball, because I have been around so many guys. I mean, I worked in sports for 20 years, and I've just been around a lot of guys in my life. And you give them a rock, and they will make a game out of it. A rock in like any sort of container, doesn't matter. Oh, I bet I can get that rock in there in less than three tries. Okay, try me. And then next thing you know, it's a tournament, and yep. there's like other guys coming in saying, "I want to play." And then you've got rules and lines drawn. I mean, yeah. so they were probably started out as football, 
but then it turned into something else and i'm like i was i just like i thought it was funny kind of getting clotheslined the whole time it was yeah. awesome i love sorry that. sorry andrew francis i mean it was your stunt double so <laughs> not really but. Like, why isn't kevin playing this is like weird <laughs> he's smart he's like i'm a paramedic i know what can happen bro I'm so funny. <laughs> yeah uh, that was really funny <laughs> I'm like, what is yeah. this adventure own game day? What is I loved it. I was like, this is such a dude thing, and all the brother eyes. Kevin was like, I'm gonna bring bait so they won't drag me into this. I'll bring my brother and throw him to the wolves. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all smart. tackle him. That's a good point. <laughs> he's like, he didn't end up with a concussion. <laughs> yeah. For real. Tell Sarah that he's going to move to Philadelphia to be with her. And he says, the way I see it, I wouldn't really be leaving my family. And I'm like, that's right. <laughs> because it's only two hours away. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I don't I know. Understand. But I thought that was really sweet because I know what he meant. And I thought that was really sweet. It was sweet, was really... but it just doesn't make sense. And so I guess I just I don't know. overthink it. I won't overthink it. But like, it's not leaving his family. His family is literally like, <laughs> I just. I don't understand. Like my whole, like for years, my grandma lived in Salt Lake and I lived in Provo, which is about mm, an hour and change. And I felt like I saw her every Sunday. Like she was, I, if you were to ask me, do you live close to your grandma? Yes, I live close to my grandma. <laughs> like what? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say, I think when you're dating and you're newly in law and you know, you're used to spending every waking minute together and then you are apart. Doesn't matter how far apart, like hour, two hours where you can't just like, Hey, grab lunch together or, you know, you know, go over there after work or whatever. Cause who wants to drive an hour and a half in traffic? Well, let's be honest. I'm, I'm going to bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I, I feel like I, I can kind of see that point, but I think it was a little kind of dramatic and their separation wasn't long enough. And I mean, I like them together. I think they're super cute and I'm glad she came back. But again, it was just kind of like a, oh, that's so cute. Okay. It was cute. I'm just a grumposaurus. Okay. <laughs> she sees, he sees her as his family. That's cute. I wish they had gotten engaged. That would have made it even cuter. Yeah, let's talk about that. Nobody got engaged this season. <laughs> because sure. I think this is the end. I think that maybe in Chesapeake Shores, you don't need to get engaged to have made a com family commitment. <laughs> like they just somehow skip over that step. And I, I, that, that would have made and it. a blood oath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made it so cute if they had gotten engaged. I would have been totally on board it. But as it was, I was just like, you're still really close to your family. You're both going to be together. I, I don't know. I, yeah. at that point I was just like Mrs. Cynical Pants, like Brie. And I was just beyond frustrated. And then they had the boat race. And that was cute. And Until they like wanted, they looked over at Trace. <laughs> <That was awesome>. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cute that like Mick saved their their boats. Yeah, cute. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like the hug. <laughs> the hug was the best part because. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The guys the, and there's Connor getting all into it, being yeah. all goofy, and there's Kevin, like, just barely. <laughs> Which, <Yeah>. uh, I... <laughs> Without a doubt, the O'Brien sandwich was the cutest part of the episode for sure. Yeah, it's probably the cutest really part of the whole was. series or the whole season. Yeah, it was because we don't get a lot of all, all of them together, mm -hmm. and when they are together, those are my, I mean. Yeah, the kitchen scenes are my favorite, but all of the brothers and sisters together are my super, super favorite. Yeah. And we didn't get a lot of that. Yeah. And so then we get a scene between Trace and Chris at the bridge. Ugh. And he's basically like, oh, this band is terrible, which they seem perfectly fine to me. But then, and he's like, you know what? You just run it however you want. I'm going on tour. And I'm like, why did we waste all of this time? With the bridge, like, what if he's just gonna be like, eh, I'm not sure. I'm like, what was well, the point yeah. of all of that? And Waffles is like, oh, you mean do my job? Great, thanks. Yes. <laughs> thanks. 
Okay, I will. Keep doing what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> Make a list many pages of all the wasted, pointless plot lines, and we got four minutes of Megan talking. I just will never. Yep. <sighs> so <laughs> then we get the cute moment of Kevin and Sarah at Sally's, and she tells Sam that uh, she's uh, she's staying. And Shane is staying at Cheswick Shores. Yeah. They have good chemistry, and that goes a long way. So then our final scenes, we have Brie coming to her parents, and they've written this letter about the book. And so uh, there's, and oh, and we also get a, uh, we get a kiss between Danielle and Connor. <laughs> thumbs down from Lisa. <laughs> Two thumbs down. Two thumbs down, Casey. How many thumbs down? <laughs> if my toes had thumbs. I'd be yeah. working those up too. Yeah, uh, so then Re- Bree is reading the letter, and basically the letter is sweet. It's nice. It says we're it's sorry. We're sorry for what we did. We're sorry for what we didn't do. And I just said sweet and all, but I wanted so much more. Mm -hmm. Which I feel like every parent could write that letter. Yeah. Because (laughs) when my kids are adults, I'll be like, I'm sorry for what I did and what I didn't do. I was on a limited budget. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry for being a human being and not being perfect. We both had to work full time to make all this work. Right. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I still yeah. introduced you to Twilight. <laughs> exactly. I got you all the Twilights on Blu-ray. Did <laughs> I do enough? Yeah. <laughs> Pair your letters now, ladies. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> we get this scene with Trace on tour wearing the cowboy hat and like he's got like <laughs> And, and then Donovan comes in with his daughter wanting an autograph of Trace because all of a sudden he's famous again I guess he was like conveniently not famous for a while and now he's famous again and this is supposed to be this whole scene is supposed to be like look look at the life that you are going this is where you're heading you're going to be like Donovan and have this daughter that you're not that connected with and whatever even though like she was there <laughs> Yeah, he was rubbing her shoulders in a little bit of a weird way for me, but, uh, but <laughs> whatever. Um, and but this was supposed to be like I felt like a sort of a cautionary tale of like, ooh, this is what's coming with your choices, Trace. And I was just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I, just, I don't know. My favorite was we got a response on Twitter from Swift Bobcat, and said, "What was the cliffhanger that someone wanted Trace's autograph?" And I was like. Uh, could you say it again for those in the back? Right. Well, I didn't. I, I didn't understand the significance of that. I mean, I guess that was, was supposed to make us feel like he was going to regret his life choices forever because he went on tour. But again, this, I, you know what? And I missed it because that was when I couldn't be on the podcast. I was sick. Um, the episode, the week that I wasn't on was the week when uh, the manager came over and was like, well, I would have good news for a normal person, but for you, you'll hate it. I got you a European tour. And I was like, this is me. This is how I feel like towards <laughs> the, the character of Chase, like everything that everyone else is like, awesome. He's like, oh God. But he's only cool. like that because Abby's nonsensical. And so he knows that he has mm. to like put up with <laughs> all this. Cause like he, I don't ever, I never felt like, he didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. I never looked like he was having fun being a musician. Ever. Yeah, that's fair. Not, never. Except <laughs> at the very beginning of the series when he and Lee started singing and he was like, yeah, we got it back, man. Let's start the band again. Yay. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that I worked with a lot of sports. I was an athletic trainer for a very long time, which if anybody doesn't know what that is, that's the person that runs out onto the field in football when somebody gets hurt and you evaluate the injuries and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So my job consisted of opening the training room at like 5.30 in the morning. 
and staying till practices. And then on game night, sometimes I was there until 1030 or 11 at night. And if it was a road game, that means even after midnight. And sometimes I'd have to show up in the middle of the night to evaluate an injury. And then sometimes it was road trips over the weekend. And it was just a constant, constant being gone and I'd leave when my kids were asleep and I'd get home when my kids were asleep and I did that for a number of years and it sucked and eventually that's why I left but we did make it work yeah we made it work for a number of years because I like food and eating and paying my bills yeah like balancing what I did for work (laughs) like balancing home and work does not mean never choosing work Mm -hmm. I wish I could never choose work yeah (laughs) yeah I don't know. I just thought, and I, I totally felt that they were saying like, Ooh, look, Trace, this is the person you're coming to be. And I'm like, that's bull crap. It's so, so ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, like, plus, oh, like, a silver fox that tours the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, heaven forbid. And has a daughter who's smiling and seems perfectly yeah. happy. And is on a tour in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. Horrible life. <laughs> And then our final scene is them boating off into the sunset. And that was very pretty. So there we go. What you think and of the season, what you thought of the finale. And thanks so much, you guys, for joining me to talk about this. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and this whole season has been amazing. <laughs> Helped me get through it. <laughs> and so, Casey, where can people find you? You can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram now at Hallmark Language. Great. And Lisa, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Girl Gone Hallmark. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews on iTunes and on YouTube. Make sure you're following the podcast, The Hallmarkies Pod, on Instagram, Twitter, all of our social media. And uh, give us your reviews on iTunes. We really appreciate it. And thanks again. And we will uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. Hey, bye. Bye. bye.